Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. I'm Farheen and I'm the secretary for the LSE Islamic Finance Society and also the, a second year law student here. I um, hope you've all enjoyed the event so far and made the most of your networking lunch. We will now be presenting the penultimate panel and based on the law and Islamic finance. Can I just ask how many lawyers we have left in the room? Could you just raise your hands? Fantastic. As a second year law student, I'm quite interested in the growing areas of law. And Islamic finance is one of the areas that's growing at a remarkable rate. Um, it's one of the areas where almost all city firms are now practicing in, and they are, they, the lawyers in this field are required to make sure that their clients' instructions and transactions are compliant with Sharia. The body of jurisprudence that has developed over the last 40 years derived from the Quran and secondary sources known as Hadith. Today we will be discussing different this um, area of law at length, particularly how it fits with the UK system and how far it differs from the English system. I'm interested in to know what our panelists think of the future of Islamic finance and the law, as personally I aspire to direct my career towards this industry in the future. So with great pleasure, we would like to welcome with us, welcome to this panel, um, Mr. Ashley Freeman from Charles Russell Speechley's. Mr. Ashley is the head of Islamic finance at Charles Russell Speechley's and has over 20 years of experience with the General Council of Central Bank of Bahrain, where he has significant role in developing the country's banking and financial services framework. His experience includes policy initiatives, such as drafting the founding articles of bodies like the IFSB and I IIFM and Bahrain's Work Fund. We also have with us today the partner of Foot and City, Imam Kazi, um, specialist in Islamic finance and real estate. Imam has over 10 years of experience in the Islamic finance market. He's also a member of the advisory board of the Association of Muslim Lawyers, the Arab Bank Association, and the Islamic Finance Experts Group. Finally, we have with us Sheikh Bilal Khan, co-chairman of Dome Advisory, which is a multidisciplinary advisory firm, and he's also a Sharia scholar. He has won the Religious Advocate of the Year Award in 2013 and the British Muslim Awards, and has received many industry awards. He has qualified for Magic Circle Law from Linklaters, and has over 20 years of experience and specializes in structuring and drafting first Sharia compliant financial products like government bonds and the kooks. So now I'd like to welcome Mr. Ashley Freeman to do a speech on his perspective of Islamic finance and the law. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Fahin, and thank you for all of you for staying till five o'clock, which is an hour over schedule. Unfortunately, there's always a lawyer at the end of every conference nowadays that um, tells you how it should be done and how it's not being done properly. Um, I guess having grown up in East London and Essex, um, it's always struck me that people who have an interest in both religion and international finance are somewhat <coughs> peculiar in nature. And I think people who try to understand the law relating to those two disciplines are perhaps the most peculiar of all, with the exception of my colleagues here today who are not peculiar in any way. Um, I think most of us in this industry have come from a background that is either predominantly religious or predominantly banking and finance and have then tried to marry the other half together to um, present a complete whole. Um, my own journey um, was first by way of religion, alhamdulillah, 30 years ago now, then into the law 25 years ago and finally into banking and finance exclusively for the last 20 years. During that time, mashallah, I've been very lucky to be part of some of the most groundbreaking things which have happened in the industry. Uh, I guess most famously, as Fahin mentioned in the introduction, as General Counsel of the Central Bank of Bahrain, regulator of, we would say, the foremost Islamic finance center in the world, which means that I was dealing with Islamic banks every day of my life for more than 15 years. Also, as the presiding lawyer over probably the most sovereign Sukuk issues that have come out of the Gulf region, uh, redesigning, restructuring countless Islamic banks over the years, inclu including, I may add, a bit ashamed about this, 
put in the first ever Islamic bank into Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceedings in the US a few years ago. The legal issues we have in this industry are absolutely immense and it's quite difficult to know where to begin. Uh, many bankers, their counterparties, investors and customers and what I call the enthusiastic drum bangers for the industry would be a little bit surprised about what goes on behind the scenes. And we're going to give you some insights into that today, or at least I am. Maybe my colleagues are going to be a bit more um, formal about this. Firstly, the problems we face. We face legal systems around the world that do not recognize basic contracts like Marabaha, Mudaraba, Musharaka, or Islamic concepts like Sukuk and Takafu and many others we could name. Not every, not every system, but many, many um, un are unable to do that. I've even come across legal systems in the Arab world where you can't say the word Islamic or Sharia because it's too controversial to write that into your laws. So as lawyers, we tend to fall back on English law, which is a very flexible system of law, to replicate Sharia. An important word here is to replicate. Um, it's ironic in a way, English law is so flexible that it's often easier to use um, a secular system than, than it would be to... Um, use the secular laws of Muslim countries. And maybe Imam might say a little bit about that later. Um, but no secular system of law is ideal because it starts from a different jurisprudential basis. Let me see if I can give you some examples of why that creates a problem. Firstly, Sharia has very specific prescribed contracts. But English and US lawyers who are mostly working on the deals, the, the big multi-cross-border deals, um, are used to writing whatever they want. So often they depart from the prescribed contracts and sometimes we end up creating two agreements in one contract, which is prohibited in Sharia. Secondly, English and US lawyers are under a professional duty to do their utmost best for their client. Remember that, Fahim, when you start practicing the law, your utmost best. So, we're not out to be fair to both sides. Uh, we act for one client only. So this often causes a conflict, and a couple of examples of this. In the SAO contracts, B, there is a duty to disclose known defects in what you're trading. But in the Anglo common law tradition, no lawyer would want to point out the defects in the contract. In fact, the IFSB, the Islamic Financial Services Board, got so annoyed about this um, a few years back that they published their very famous statement saying there is no caveat emptor in Sharia. I think the statement was a little bit confused because they slightly missed the point that caveat emptor is never... Uh, a concept that will allow outright fraud or even misrepresentation. But, but it was a, an attempt to redress the balance. Um, the good old Marabaha contract is subject to enormous abuse. Lawyers of the Anglo common law tradition have consistently closed down the title transfer risk. And I'm sure if you know anything about Islamic finance, you know about the concept of risk sharing. We are now at a stage where effectively there is no title transfer risk in any Marabaha. I've seen everything over the years. I've seen everything from outright contractual promises to acquire to indemnities compensating the bank for the customer's failure to purchase. I saw last year a POA, a power of attorney uh, for a bank that could be used by the bank to step into the customer's shoes effectively take on the persona of the customer in the event that he fails to purchase. I think that goes way beyond the, the agency Wakala principle, which in itself I think is sometimes misused in Marabaha, but to actually step into the shoes of the customer just doesn't sound right to me. Maybe that's something you want to pick up on later, Sheikh Bilal. And of course, then we also have the enforceable unilateral promise which brings me to the very wonderful concept of double wad. Two unilateral promises 
going in opposite directions, which looks rather like a contract. There isn't one document, but when both parties are promising each other to perform in a certain way, um, it, it, it effectively, you could argue, creates something like a contract. And that means that we're now able to create, so it is said, Sharia compliant derivatives, Sharia compliant hedge funds, Sharia compliant netting agreements, and maybe Sheikh, you would like to comment on that um, later. The use of standard documents is another enormous problem for the legal profession. I heard one of the guys this morning, I think it was the guy from Ernst & Young, said, we need more standardization, we need more. Everybody says we need more standardization, but few people seem to realize the road this is taking us down. But let me tell you what the secret is. The big global banking groups and the magic circle law firms, they want standardization. They want it because it means they can scale up their economies and squeeze out the smaller players out of the industry. At best, at best it's anti-competitive. At worst, it is an attempt to replicate the loan market association and the conventional industry. The prophet, peace be upon him, supposedly said it's a disputed hadith. Difference of opinion is a mercy for my community. Yet the Muslims are continually Muslims in Islamic finance are continually calling for standardization, calling for uniformity of products, a one-size-fits-all approach that denies individual needs, denies individual spiriti spirituality, and, and will, in my opinion, ultimately leave us worse off. Tawuk is already killing the industry. Tawuk, commodity marabaha, um, because it allows people to effectively replicate a conventional loan. And it is obstructing innovation because it's an easy option. I'm working with a group of businessmen around the world at the moment, and we're hoping to bring a new product offering in Islamic finance that will, if not outlaw Tawawuk, but certainly diminish its impact. The Omani regulator has already spoken out against Tawawuk, and I think um, other regulators will do so eventually. Should we mention Sukuk? How are we doing for time? Sukuk is in itself is a um, very controversial issue. We could talk endlessly. I could talk, for you, talk to you for the rest of the week about the controversy between asset-backed Sukuk and asset-based Sukuk. Sukuk is supposed to be a product that evidences an ownership interest in real assets, or at least a tangible investment of some kind. That there needs to be something real that you take your Sukuk certificate over. Yet the reality is, at least 90% of Sukuk issued today don't have proper legal recourse to an underline. And even when they do have proper recourse to an underline, it's virtually impossible to realize that interest for reasons we can't go in today. Should we mention accounting treatment, um, which is often out of synchronization with what the lawyers are doing Accountancy, law, I think law comes first, actually. Well, it certainly comes first in the court of law. If you listen to um, AOFI, I hope you're all familiar with AOFI. AOFI is the Accounting and Auditing Association of the Islamic industry. They talk about, um, well, they make this distinction between restricted and unrestricted, Mudarba, which is very important, correct, as a matter of law. But then they, they decide that restricted is off-balance sheet, and unrestricted is on balance sheet. And very wonderfully, and I've had this discussion with many sheikhs, and maybe you want to pick up on this as well, Bilal, they say that it is a, quote, a separate line item, a separate line item in the balance sheet between un ordinary unsecured creditors and shareholders' equity. Now, two issues with this. Firstly, if I say to my investment manager, buy me textiles in Iraq. I've made it a restricted mudaraba. That somehow takes me off the bank's balance sheet. But the guy that just stands there and says, I don't care how you deal with my money, that's unrestricted and that immediately goes onto the ba bank's balance sheet as part of their entitlement. That can't be wrong. That can't be justified in Sharia. The second issue, perhaps more worryingly, 
is what would a court of law make of this distinction between a separate line item on the balance sheet between ordinary unsecured and shareholders' equity? Find me a legal system in the world that will apply that reasoning. There isn't one. There isn't one. These accountancy rules that are being compelled on Islamic banks, they won't be enforceable in a court of law. I'm very concerned about the time. One more minute. Oh, my gosh. So let me skip a few things. Let me skip regulation. Let me skip tax issues. I'm going to talk about ethics because ethics has been mentioned a lot today. And alhamdulillah, we're starting to address this subject now after a, a gap for so many years. I made a suggestion at a conference about 18 months ago. There was, there was a panel of three or four, I think it's four, um, asset managers on stage, and they were all talking about how wonderful their product was, Sharia compliant product, never, year on year, double digit returns will never fail. It's, you know, the most wonderful thing you could want. And I was sitting in the audience and I was thinking, yeah, this is great, but what's the value of this? How does this actually help the Ummah? Does this add any? Um, contribution to what we're trying to do. So I made a suggestion. Every time you issue a prospectus or every time you issue an information memorandum, you stick in the back a very small clause that says, the reason I'm raising this money is that I think my product has the following social benefit to the community, to the UMA. And the response from the stage was silence. And eventually, one of them said, no, 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 we can't have this. This just impacts. This is too much red tape. It impacts on our ability to do business. Um, it's not for us to consider what the social benefit is to do. And I just thought, no, you're, you're in a different industry to me. I'm going to wind up talking about the most important legal subject there is in Islamic finance. It's the one subject which everybody fails to address, but it sits right at the very bottom of what we're trying to do. So much of banking and finance is about confidence and knowing what happens when it all goes awfully wrong. Because we go to so many of these Islamic finance conferences where people are trying to sell their products, sell their institution, and it sounds fantastic. But as lawyers, we're always very conscious who picks up the last dollar when the, the project unwinds. And um, I think, you know, if we're looking at something like Dubai Weld, which was a, a very infamous Sukuk collapse, a default, um, they had to bring in special legislation to cure that situation. Um, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is you cannot do a Sharia compliant workout um, anywhere in the world, as far as I'm concerned. I've tried to do it. The, the, the problems are enormous. Firstly, the, the bankruptcy rulings in Sharia need further analysis because it, it's such a big gap in our learning that we need to um, understand how we're dealing with bankruptcy and then we need to import those rules into domestic legal systems. Um, but perhaps the most important thing is if, you're, if your institution or if your product is distressed, what is the first thing which um, the creditors will, will do in that situation? Do they sit around and drink coffee with the bank or financial institution that sold them the product? No, they don't. The first thing they do is they try and get it off their book. They sell it down as quickly as they can to take whatever price they get. What, what do you think happens? Do you think they actually contact the Islamic banks in London saying, I've got $5 million worth of distressed debt. Would you like to buy it? brother, sister. No, they don't do that. They, they sell it to the cheapest person or, or, or the person that will give them the best price in the shortest time frame. And I've had so many, um, I've had to pick up so many Islamic banks that have collapsed where their, um, their, their interest, their creditors' interests have been sold down to hedge funds and sold down to other outfits that, that basically trade this money, you can't have a sensible conversation with them. The first thing they will say to you is, I want my interest, my riba, to be kept current. That's critical to me. Because they're not Muslim institutions, they don't give a damn about Sharia, they just want the return on their defaulting product. So I'm going to wind up now. Um, oh, I should just say, if, uh, if, if you're unfortunate enough to actually get into a liquidation, which is the stage that happens when you can't actually work out your problems, then really 
heaven help you, because no one seems to know which instruments sit outside the reach of the liquidator, um, nor which instruments are available to the liquidator, nor which are um, part of the shareholders' residue. But it's not all bad news. We've made a lot of progress in a very short time, and a good lawyer, inshallah, can often find a solution. When I agonize about the legal system in Islamic finance, I'm always comforted by this hadith. It's the last thing I'm going to say. I know we shouldn't quote hadith, but, but you're going to allow me this one. Um, for every illness, Allah has provided a cure except death. And so it is with Islamic finance. All these issues have a cure unless we allow the industry to bleed to death in the meantime. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Ashley. I think Ashley's given us a taste of how vast and complex the subject is of law and um, Islamic finance. So I'm going to follow Naomi's advice from the previous session and um, keep it simple. Um, I might just aim my comments today at the um, students out there who might be thinking about a career in law and a career in um, Islamic finance in particular. And I thought I'd just co cover three things um, very quickly. Um, firstly, I'll just give you a brief um, insight into my route into um, becoming an Islamic finance lawyer. Um, I'll just mention a bit about um, English law and its relevance in Islamic finance. Um, and then finally, just um, touch on why Islamic finance is so attractive um, to uh, law firms um, in, in the UK. So um, on the first point, um, my, my journey into law, I studied... Um, law and e economics um, and during that period I was also you know very interested in in Islam and studying a lot about Sharia but very much on an informal basis um, I decided I wanted to take up a career in law um, I did some, had some experience in, in the city and realized that that's not quite the life for me um, I'm, I'm from the West Country I live out, I was born and brought up in Bath and um, I live in Bristol and luckily there's some good law firms outside of London uh, where you can practice some decent law as well. So I opted for a law firm in Bristol, um, and I started practicing um, law. And my, my, specialist top, my specialism was um, real estate. So I was a real estate lawyer for um, a number of years. Um, in the background, obviously, still interested in Islam and you know, studying, studying the, the religion of Islam and Sharia. But that was very much kind of a, 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 a hobby, a pastime, very separate from my, my working life where I was a, a corporate real estate lawyer. Um, then two things happened. One is I got slightly bored of being a real estate lawyer. You know, there's only so much property you can buy and sell and lease um, and develop. Um, and then it came to a point where I, you get to that stage in your life where you want to you know, buy your first house or apartment. And then I realized that you know, riba is a, a very serious injunction. Um, and what, what are the solutions? You know, every problem has a solution, as Ashley pointed out. Um, and there, there were Islamic mortgages available. So back in the, in the late 90s, uh, I managed to get a, a Murabaha um, mortgage um, or contract whereby the bank acquired the property uh, for a certain price and then sold it to me, a uh, spot transaction on a deferred payment basis, um, which has its pros and cons, uh, but it, it was a bit of an eye opener. Um, and then, I, th then, at the same time as that happened, then sort of the Islamic finance started to emerge, and I think it was mentioned in one of the earlier sessions about Eddie George and his, um, his push to level the playing field that was happening around the mid 2000s. Um, so I, I was, that, that sort of perked my interest. Um, then I met um, a quite inspirational lawyer called um, Mohammed Paracha, who's now at Norton Rose out in, um, out in the Middle East. Um, and he, he opened my eyes further to the potential for um, you know, the Islamic finance as, as a business uh, opportunity for, a, for an ambitious lawyer. So I set about um, converting my um, real estate specialism and practice into an Islamic finance practice. And that took about 10 years of hard work um, to learn about Islamic finance, to get, get, the, get to know the right people and to understand the needs of the Islamic finance market and how lawyers can best serve it. And that took a long time, but it was, um, it was time well spent, I think, because in everything you do, whether you succeed or fail, um, you, you always learn something and you move on and you, and you, and you keep gradually increasing um, your um, intensity of what you're doing and, and alhamdulillah eventually we de developed a, a sizable Islamic finance practice which employs a number of people and acts for a number of banks and financial institutions etc. Um, so th that was kind of my journey into, into um, law. Um, you know, why is English law so relevant to Islamic finance globally? Um, I'll just touch on that. I think 
just two, two things spring to mind. One is that um, Sharia and English law, despite you know various issues and differences, for the most part are actually very similar and very compatible. A lot of the basic principles of English law, as you know, come down to contract, you know, buying and selling, offer and acceptance, consideration, certainty. And the, the very same principles apply to, to Sharia in slightly different ways in different contexts, but as a broad basis point, the, the fundamentals are the same. And English law will give effect to what the parties intend. So if the parties intend something to be Sharia compliant, the English law courts will give, a, give effect to that. And that's why Islamic finance contracts, whether they're in the UK or the Middle East or almost anywhere else in the world, are very often governed by English laws. And why English law is therefore um, pays plays a pivotal role in Islamic finance globally. And therefore, again, that, uh, leading to you know, the opportunities that this gives to lawyers um, in the UK. So the final point then, so, so why are um, law firms so interested in having an Islamic finance practice, or developing it, or looking into it, or exploring it? Um, and it comes down to um, this, the, the, the legal market in the UK, I think yeah, we have to realize, is, is, a, moving, is a moving beast. Um, there's so many things that are changing all the time. There's new entrants, there's different ways of doing things, there's technological advantage, uh, advances, there's um, on onshoring, offshoring, outsourcing, all these different things are impacting upon the, the life of a lawyer. Um, so what law firms really want to, and, and what they need in order to, su to succeed is differentiation. So what differentiates um, you know, this law firm from another one? Uh, and what it comes down to is certain specialisms. So whether that specialis is specialism is Islamic finance, or whether it's um, aviation or, or anything else, um, the em emphasis on the differentiation and the specialism is key for, for law firms. Um, most of the work that lawyers do is pretty standard and straightforward and repetitive, but there's a small proportion of it, of it which is quite complicated, quite unique and quite innovative. So by concentrating on those areas, that's where kind of law firms um, succeed, and I think that's why it's so attractive a proposition for um, law firms in the UK. And I shall leave it at that for now. Thank you. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wahdah, wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'dah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi alladhina awfa wahdah. I had to have, uh, say the longer khutbah because everybody's saying the khutbah, being a scholar, you've got to actually extend that slightly. Um, I've got the job of being, I think, the last speaker of this call. Is it event? This panel. This panel. Is there another panel for this? Okay. Anyways, it's still a graveyard shift, and uh, I've been handed this shift a few times in the various conferences. Uh, inshallah, I'll keep my, my piece very short as well, so we can have a, an extended Q&A session. Ashley kindly mentioned a few points and, and mentioned uh, my name, so I've got to pick up that, otherwise he'll say you, know, you avoided uh, those topics. It's, it's always a pleasure uh, being with Ashley and, and Imam Qazi. And I mean, the first time I came across uh, Imam, the, in the two names, Imam and Qazi, <laughs> very powerful. Uh, Imam being a, a leader of Muslim, Qazi being a judge. I thought, which one is he? Is he Imam or is he Qazi? Uh, mashallah. Uh, mashallah. <laughs> And, and, and uh, Freeman, you know, I thought I used to get confused. Freeman, or is it Freemason? What is this, all this? No, uh, no, no, yeah. no, no, and don't say the other one neither. <laughs> no, no, I almost said a third one. Uh, but anyway, alhamdulillah, it's, it's, it's a pleasure, um, obviously, sharing the panel with, with the two um, esteemed um, practitioners. I, I'll tell you a bit about my, my career and a very short kind of whistle-stop journey, uh, then pick up some of the stuff that uh, Ashley's pointed to. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about, you know, everybody talks about, and Ashley's mentioned it, um, the problems we have today in, in the Islamic finance space and globally in conventional finance. I want to look at the reasons why we have those problems. It's, it's, it's good to state the problems. Sometimes people look at solutions, but those solutions are actually just temporary solutions. We don't, if you don't look at the root canal treatment, you know, you'll never be able to treat it. It's a bit like going to, uh, you know, I have a bit of a skin condition, I go to a dermatologist, uh, and he says, oh, here, here's a bit of a cream, if you use this, it goes away for a few weeks and comes back again. So inshallah, I'll, I'll look at that. First and foremost, um, as you probably know, I have wear two hats in terms of um, profession or, or s studies. I, I started my journey as a, a student of Islam, Sharia, um, and, and um, 
that was memorizing the Quran by heart at the age of 11, which was uh, in Yorkshire, Bradford, where I was born. Uh, my father wanted me to be an imam, um, and uh, so I thought, yes, why not? That's a good. Uh, it's a good. You ended up a freeman. Yeah, I ended up becoming a freeman. Yeah, um, and that, that's the journey because I, I was given honorary freedom of the city of London, so I became a freeman. <laughs> started off as an imam, uh, so I memorized the Quran uh, at the age of 11, and then went to an, a traditional Islamic institution to study Arabic, uh, which is uh, has been throughout our history. The great scholars, scholars of tafsir, hadith, fiqh have always studied uh, Arabic language, because if you don't understand the language, and we don't just mean knowing to how to speak it, actually the etymology, the morphology, and how the different sciences and branches of Arabic work. Uh, I had two years in Bury, Greater Manchester, at an Islamic institution there, and then I went for about eight years to Karachi, where Mufti Taqi Usmani, Sheikh Taqi Usmani is. Uh, he's one of the scholars, obviously, he's well known in the Islamic finance space, but there are his teachers there as well. And I had the good fortune of studying with some of those uh, amazing scholars. Uh, we, we talk about professors in Oxford, Harvard, and Cambridge. Yeah? Tell me anyone you've come across in his 57-year life has written 1,368 books. There's no one in the entire, I've come across, any of these geniuses that you mentioned. And then tell me someone who you've come across at the age of 86 knows 750,000 books by heart, word for word. This is, so the amazing, this is down to spirituality. You know, the, you could, and this is what I'm going to speak about today. And, and inshallah, that's very important. You, we've read our Zuhur and Asr today. You know, people can do wudu and, and go up and down and read their Zuhur and Asr. And that's prayers. Um, and, and that's from outwardly, you'll say that's, that's a prayer done. But you know the very first hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, everywhere? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions will be judged according to the intentions. If a prayer, a, a Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith, man salla wa ra'a, he who prays, but his intention is to show others that he's a prayer, he's somebody who prays, faqad ashraka, indeed he has done shirk. So the reason why we are today where we are, Islamic finance or conventional finance, is down to something deep inside us. If you don't change that, you can change different countries and put Islamic labels on them, say there's Islamic law and regulation here. If you can't establish Islam on your five foot, six foot body, in totality, you won't change anything. It's the mindset. It is a reason why the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu worked on. Look at the verse of Quran. Allah says in Quran, to the same people who wouldn't forgive generations over a small argument and they would kill each other. And on one thing came, which was Islam, in real essence, Allah says in Quran, you became asbahtum bi ni'matihi ikhwana. You became true br brothers. And there's a, a legal maxim in Sharia, a legal maxim, which says, ta'asharu kal ikhwan wa ta'amalu kal ajanib. Your social relations with one another should be, regardless if that person is Muslim or non-Muslim, should be like blood brothers as though you are related. And your financial dealings, including Islamic finance, should be like strangers. You should document every single thing. English law and the world's laws, Roman law and everything else, has come later. And they've taken a lot, where sometimes they've given credit and sometimes they haven't given credit. Whether it's waqf, contract law, you know, even if you look at Maqasid al-Sharia, 1943 is Abra Abraham Maslow comes up with his hierarchy of needs. He's actually almost the five needs there and five maqasid sharia, very close. Sharia looks at the fabric. It changes you as a person. Sharia isn't just about a set of worships. Sharia is about financial dealings. It's about your etiquette. It's about so social relations. Unless we change all of that, it doesn't matter. I mean, don't you think the people that worked in Enron and all of these other collapses, Lehman Brothers, were not Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge graduates? Well-spoken. Don't you think they had uh, uh, ethics and rules that we're talking about here? Some of their work was CSR as well, co uh, Corporate Social Responsibility. Big statements on their websites. It's the person. If you haven't got haya in your eyes, Rasulullah sallallahu was sitting in a gathering and he had his shins exposed at one time. Uthman walked in, the person who married his two daughters, one after the other, when one passed away, and he used to call him the bearer of two lights. He walked in and Rasulullah sallallahu lowered his lower garment. He had so much haya from this man. He said, 
Uthman, istahyat min ka malaikatu rahman. Uthman, you are somebody that even the angels of Allah have haya from. When you bring those qualities of integrity inside a person, you can leave your shop doors open. And this is what used to happen in the times of the Sahaba, the companions of Rasulullah and people used to leave their shops there. There was no rulings for that. But now you have to make so many rules and regulations, and I've spoken to many, you know, we've all spoken to many central bankers and regulators and others, they're constantly chasing, it's like, you know, uh, it's a cat chasing the mice after all these banks. And uh, I'm, I've been in law firms, you know, they've introduced me as a former magic circle lawyer with Linklaters, you know, so if you want to be a lawyer, you, that's probably one of the pinnacle you can get to, Clifford Chance and, and other firms. We've also worked at big firms. I'm not going to mention any person or any, any particular firm because obviously, you know, this isn't a job here. But our job was to find loopholes, how to skirt around the law. So you're told, you know, law is about law abiding. No, it's about finding loopholes, ways around it. And they said the same thing to me about Sharia as well. They thought Sharia is another similar kind of English law type of thing. They said to me, well, we've got to get this transaction done. It's one of the world's top two, three uh, companies. And we want you to find a way. Isn't that clause 2.11 says this? Doesn't it say may? Can we not translate and interpret that as we can allow this and that practice? You know, a particular organization wanted 95% of the, the assets and still wanted to call it sharing the pooling of the fund and not risk transfer, which is completely, you know, flies in the face of Sharia. So the problem is human beings. People make industries, people make products. They don't just appear out of nowhere. Rasulullah said two words, A'malukum, ummalukum. Your actions are your rulers, your people. Rulers don't come, and these, this all corrupt Islamic finance industry, which we are facing today. Corrupt is not because they've come from the heavens. They're not non-Muslims that are trying to corrupt you. It's your greed inside. If you want to maximize... Who tells me? I mean, we've heard at this conference and many of the conferences that we talk about prophets. You know what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said? To he, at one occasion he mentioned ten companions and he named them. Every comp our belief is that every companion is going to Jannah. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on one occasion said ten by name. He said you're going to Jannah. One of those ten is Abdurrahman bin Auf. Abdurrahman, the son of Auf. He is known amongst the Sahaba, the companion, as one of two who had enormous amount of wealth and who gave a lot of charity and it had a lot of business transactions. You know what he said to him? Listen to this, those who talk about profit maximization. He said, oh Abdul Rahman bin Auf, you will come to Jannah, you guarantee Jannah, very late. You will be crawling on your feet. Because, look, if you go to airport, you have one suitcase. You can only answer for one suitcase, yeah? If you've got two suitcases, you've got more to answer for. You've got two properties, keep, if this is the, the attitude that we have today, Rasulullah was lying on his side, on a bed. And because of the bed was very hard, he had the imprints of that. Umar bin Khattab saw him and he had tears in his eyes. He said, O oh Rasulullah, the leaders of Persia and the Romans have all of these riches of the world. Why don't you pray to Allah? What did Rasulullah said to him? O oh Umar, have you failed to understand my message? Islam is is a completely different way of life. It teaches you qana'ah, contentment. Have, what you have, be happy with that. There's nothing wrong with having a lot, but provided it goes through a certain way. So we have to look. This is the problem today in the entire conventional and Islamic finance industry. Why? Because the people who are in the structuring departments, in the origination departments, are the same people. They only know how to skin the cut in one way. They only know how to structure the product. The people who are structuring Sukuk, and Ashley's mentioned this rightly, are the same people with a bond mindset. It's another bond. You know, convent Sukuk is, today the way it's practiced, is an Islamic bond. And by the way, the problem with the word Islamic today is, you just bring a product, laterally Islamize it, and say, here's Islamic, it's an Islamic product, another Islamic product. And we've got this uh, very good example that uh, Ashley mentioned of double wa'ad. Wa'ad is a promise. A promise in Islam, and in English law, and in any, any part of the world, is a unilateral undertaking. It's a unilateral thing. It's not supposed to be binding. I will not give you a promise, right? Any promise that you make has to be unilateral. If you promise me something, there's nothing wrong with that. I promise you something separately, but they're both interlinked. Because your, your promise will never happen if I did not promise you in return. They found a minority opinion in the Maliki school. Even Malikis don't accept that. And they gave rulings on that today, and they say this is the, the practice. 
it's, it, it behaves, it behaves like a contract. Just because you have a label of a wa'ad or a promise doesn't do anything. Unfortunately, our industry is based on these products. Remember, one many people, is, Islamic finance or Islamic business, Islamic commerce has been practiced for a thousand years before this. We never used to have these kind of funky uh, uh, products. We don't need that. We need to go back to the basics and, and make sure that we do things in the right way. As a lawyer, somebody who's understood, I've looked at many contracts, government regulations, had a, sat on treasury committee here, all the boards you like, all the conferences you like, we've done it all, all of us between us here, we've done it all, and I'm, I'm telling you something, that doesn't, isn't what we want to be. We don't want to be there. What you want to do, if you want to come into Islamic finance industry, whether you want to be lawyers, bankers, accountants, whatever it is, first thing you've got to understand that what is the maqsad, what is the purpose of my life and what I want to achieve here. What do I want to achieve? Because at the end of the day, there are needs. You can satisfy the needs. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you start to say, I'm going to change everything and make it Islamic. A particular bank came to me and said, we have a MasterCard equivalent Islamic product. Can you look at it and, and give us your Sharia opinion? First of all, I've made a lifetime commitment. I will never sit on a Sharia board. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be on anybody's payroll and then having to give independent judgment. I can't. So I said to them, can you send me the legal documentation, a suite of documentation? A, a suite of, I, I always get messages, you know, because obviously I, I went to Switzerland and to speak a keynote speech, I did a two hour speech. Uh, it was supposed to be 15 minutes, but nobody uh, disturbed me actually. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I said to them, uh, give me the entire legal suite of documentation and give me this, uh, the structure diagram, which is what we as lawyers get, we get all the doc. He said, no, 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 no. He said, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, it was a Saturday. I know I can remember because I was having egg and uh, beans in the morning. I was having breakfast uh, and this call happened from a big bank. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we will send you this particular diagram. Can you look at it? Uh, and, and let us know if it's Sharia compliant. I said, I don't work like that. I don't look at diagrams, you know, and, and start uh, make, giving you uh, opinions. He said, I said, give me the entire suite of documents and I'll tell you. In the same call, I'm not, I'm not joking, wallahi, I swear, I've read Asr. He said, I'll, I'll wire $60,000 into your account. I said, when I grew up in 80s, there used to be a $60 million man on TV. Even if you make me a $60 million man, I'm not gonna sign this. This is the rubbish you go through. So I've refused to be on any HSBC standard chartered bank and I've been approached by many organizations to, and I've stayed away from it. So I think it's better for you. Yes, today, as some of the earlier panelists said, it's hard, there isn't a, a specific Islamic finance degree that takes you straight to a job. So if your niya intention is that you wanna get some exposure, fine, go and do what I did, which is get some professional qualifications, get exposure into an environment. But if you think you're gonna change it from within, you know, all of us have had experience, really, be honest, be, uh, hand on heart here. You're not gonna, because it's what, there's four pillars that make any industry, anything, whether it's music, Islam, anything else in the world right now. Political will, what does the state want? And, and, and the p policy makers. Number two, what is the enabling environment? Legislation, it's like a square peg in a round hole. The, the environment is there in this country and in the entire world. Debt gets favorable treatment. There's, there's the, it, interest is tax deductible. Forget Islam, just generally. An equity dividend is, is, is an expense. So look at, the, the, look at the treatment. And number three is institutions, and number four is intellectual capital. These are very important building blocks. So what we need to look at is these kind of issues. So I've, I've mentioned some of the issues that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 as, uh, as what Ashley's mentioned and obviously a bit about my career as well, and, and I've mentioned some of the hadiths uh, which are important. He mentioned a very nice hadith which is لِكُلِّ دَا إِن دَوَا For every illness there is a cure, إِلَّا الْمَوْتِ Except for death. And, and we need to, and there is, that means there is a solution for every problem out there. So inshallah we'll take some of the questions if you have those, and, and anybody who can't, we can't answer now, inshallah you can take our details and we're happy to help, happy to mentor and coach those that you need anything else in, you know, with your legal careers or anything else, inshallah.